primary and non-tectonic structures. So the first thing is we want to talk about is what is a geologic structure? What do we mean when we say geologic structure? This is something that is a definable shape or fabric in a rock body. It's something when you see it you can see a definable shape. So pretty much everything that you see when you look outdoors is some kind of geologic structure. There are tectonic structures and these form in response to the forces generated by plate interactions. And there are non-tectonic structures. These are things that are not directly formed by tectonic processes. Although this can be misleading since almost all structures are at least an indirect result of plate tectonics. But the distinction is a direct result versus not a direct result. So in this chapter we're going to focus on the non-tectonic structures. Then for the rest of the semester we'll worry about the tectonic structures. So how many structures can you think of? You're probably thinking well none I haven't started the course yet. But if you think about what you see outside, hills, valleys, riverbeds, mountains, all of those are geologic structures. And there are many more. So we'll start with sedimentary structures. This is an example from the Goblin Valley State Park, a photo taken by one of our professors here at UND showing some sedimentary structures. You may think, oh, it's just lines in the rock. That is a structure. It's a definable shape. You can see it. It's different rock layers all laying flat on top of each other. This is another example of sedimentary structures. This one has even finer beds and it's not sandstone. It's more shaly sand. So let's talk about some terminology. This bedding. This is layering or stratification of an outcrop. This is what you can see like those layers in those last two photos. And just a point, an outcrop is a noun. It is a word that means rock that crops out of the landscape to where you can see it. So rocks crop out, but they don't outcrop. Outcrop is not a verb. It's just a noun. So bedding. What defines bedding? Well, it's the smallest subdivision of a sedimentary unit. So you can have a large section of sedimentary rock that's all got the same name, like the Hell Creek Formation is a sedimentary unit. But within that, there can be smaller individual beds. It has a definable top or bottom, usually both, and it's distinguishable from adjacent beds. So you can't just say, well, my ruler goes down to a millimeter, so every millimeter is another bed. It's distinctly different from the next one. You can see a visible line or Sometimes it's a color change, sometimes it's a texture or mineral change, but it's distinctly different, or at least distinguishable. Sometimes the difference is kind of minor. 
If you look at Table 2.2 .2 on page 16 of your textbook, there are lots of bedding descriptions there. Instead of covering them all in lecture, you can look at that table and take notes of the key things that they discuss. And then as we progress through the semester, you'll probably notice some of them. If you go off to field camp, you'll definitely see some of that. Um, if you take sedimentology and stratigraphy, it goes really in depth into sedimentary structures and beds. So some of the things that I do want to cover though are bedding parallel parting. This is when you have beds that were buried and then all of the stuff that was on top, all of the overlaying strata are removed. So the beds that we're looking at kind of decompact. It's like if you have a sponge in the kitchen and you set something heavy on it and you leave it there for a while, the sponge gets really flat. But if you take that heavy thing off, the sponge slowly expands again. Even rock can do that, just not nearly as much as the sponge. This can cause some separation of the beds, a lot like one of the photos we saw earlier. We call this unloading because we took the load of the overlying rock away and the rock that we're looking at got to expand slightly. Facility. Not facility, but facility. This is when a rock has closely spaced partings, allowing it to break apart into small pieces and layers easily. This is very common in shale. When the grains of sediment align with their flat surfaces in a parallel manner, we call this imbrication. And we can use it to judge paleocurrent. So even if a river hasn't flowed for a hundred million years, we can tell which way the water was moving by looking at the imbrication. It's kind of like shingles on a roof. We know the water runs down the shingles because, well, first of all, we know the orientation of a roof, but if you look at the shingles and think about water flowing, it makes sense for it to go in one direction. If it were going the other way, it would be catching on the shingles and causing problems. So here's that example of bedding parallel parting. You can see, you know, once upon a time there was probably a lot of rock up above, you know, up here going out of the photo where the sky shows. All that is eroded away. Unloading this section of rock in the photo and so it is expanding and splitting. Facility allows it to break apart really easily into flakes and chunks like in this shale here. And here is an example of large iron flakes, i.e. cars, exhibiting imbrication. Now this didn't happen from simple river water flow. This happened after a tsunami hit. This was over in Japan at a large car dealership lot. And you can tell that the water was coming from the right of the photo moving to the left because of the way the cars are stacked up on each other. This is imbrication. Here you can see natural imbrication. No cars involved. This is rocks exhibiting imbrication. And you can tell that the flow is from the right to the left again.
Original horizontality. It's not just a rule, it's the law. The law of original horizontality. This was discovered by Nicholas Steno. The way I always remember that and have helped many students and even a few colleagues remember his name is to think of a steno pad. A nickname for a stenographer's notebook. This is the notebook with a little spiral at the top. You can flip the pages over the top and when you look at the lines they're all horizontal and parallel. When rock layers are laid down the sediments start horizontal and parallel. This is important because if the strata, if those rock layers are inclined or tilted or broken or folded, if they're anything but nice horizontal parallel lines, we know that these deviations are because of events that occurred after deposition. It's always deposited in horizontal and parallel layers, so if there's anything but that, then something happened afterwards. This can provide a geologist information about a depositional environment, about the younging direction of the rock, you know, which is the older rock, which is the younger rock, information about air current and water current, and very importantly, about the stresses involved in changing that strata. Here is an example where you can see layers that are still horizontal and parallel and an area where the rock is not horizontal and parallel anymore. It's tilted and in between there it's bent. So we know something had to happen after that rock was deposited to cause that. And when you think about how much rock is there, to bend and tilt that much rock, you know that what happened was pretty big and tremendous.